If you missed the first section, don't worry about it. Uh, you can go back and watch part one or two or three or whatever out of order. It doesn't matter. I split these segments up into sections that are independent of each other. So don't sweat it if you didn't see the others first. So I figure we just continue listening to Kent Hovind here and see what he has to say. I think before the flood came, <coughs> I think things were a whole lot different. With increased oxygen, you would heal up much faster. How many of you remember baby Jessica that fell into the well in Texas? 18 months old, her left leg slipped down in a pipe. Her right leg came up behind her and she did the splits as she slid down inside an eight inch steel pipe. She went down 20 feet and was stuck there for two and a half days. They tore up the whole neighborhood trying to get that kid out of that well. It was on the news about every 15 minutes. Remember that? You know, baby Jessica is still alive. When they finally got her out of that well, lots of her body had turned black from lack of circulation. Her right leg was totally black because it had been twisted around and stuck in her face from behind doing the splits. One of the doctors said, we have to cut her leg off immediately. Another doctor said, hey, before we cut the leg off, let's just try putting her in a hyperbaric oxygen chamber. You know what? Hyperbaric oxygen. They put Jessica in one of these chambers, filled it up full of pure oxygen, and pumped it up to double normal pressure. Okay, let's look this one up too. I guess we're gonna we're devoted now to looking up everything that this guy says. Baby Jessica. Wait, oops, I was typing in the wrong. Hang on. Baby Jessica, 1987. Uh, well, rescue of Jessica McClure. Okay, let's just look this up real quick. Guess the girl's name was Jessica McClure. This is a Wikipedia page about it. Huh. How about that? Nothing about oxygen on this entire page anywhere. Let's see. Jessica McClure, oxygen treatment. Uh, Jessica was also treated with pressurized oxygen in a hyperbaric chamber, which speeds healing of tissue. Plastic surgeon Terry Tubb examined Jessica's forehead where he said she had lost skin about the size of a silver dollar above her eyebrows. Wow, that sucks. This is a Washington Post article about it. In a hyperbaric chamber, he said doctors would work slowly to replace the skin to minimize scarring. Wow. Jessica had fallen into the well's eight-inch opening. Wow, eight-inch opening. That's tiny, dude. Wednesday morning while playing with two other children in the backyard of an aunt's house where her mother helped her run a small daycare center. Okay, interesting. Let's keep listening to Kent then. We know she was... Uh, they put her in a hyperbaric oxygen chamber because high pressure and oxygen speeds healing during surgery or after surgery, I guess. All right, let's keep listening. Hyperbaric oxygen. They put Jessica in one of these chambers, filled it up full of pure oxygen, and pumped it up to double normal pressure. Within a few hours, her leg turned pink. They restored circulation. They saved her leg. Okay, I'm skeptical about the within a few hours claim. Um, from my understanding, they did save the leg, I believe, so that's something. I guess he's telling the truth about that one. Let's continue. They did have to amputate half of her little toe, okay? They couldn't save that. It beats losing a leg by a long shot. By the way, do you know what you call a girl if one leg is shorter than the other? Oh, here we go. This is going to be a terrible joke. Ready? Eileen. Just a little bit of trivia there, okay? Uh, <clears throat> Okay. There's a lock chamber in Pensacola, Florida. This one in Pensacola holds 30 people in an emergency. A lot of hospitals are getting these hyperbaric chambers. Does UT Medical Center have a hyperbaric chamber? They do? Do you know how big it is? Does it one or two or three person or one person? Okay. West Germany is treating stroke patients with hyperbaric oxygen, getting incredible recovery from strokes. In England, they're treating multiple sclerosis. They treat like I said, I don't want to look up every single claim from this guy, but look, there isn't even a source listed on this one. Over 6,000 multiple sclerosis patients are now being treated. I mean, is there a source in a minute? 3850? Oh, here's... Okay, no, there, there doesn't seem to be a source on this one. He just didn't list a source. Uh, there is a source on this one, hyperbaric.com. I only accept .gov or .edu sources, FYI, usually. Uh, I make few exceptions. What is hyperbaric.com? And why did you give me an email address as a source? Have a chamber in Vancouver, 50 an hour. What? This isn't even a source. This is an advertisement. What the hell is happening right now? 
Well, we know that hyperbaric oxygen chambers do speed healing to some degree. Does not mean that Adam and Eve were some superhumans because they lived in a, an oxygen-rich environment or something like that. FYI, 6,000 years ago, oxygen was the same level as it is today, basically. It's not until you go all the way back to the Cretaceous period, I believe, that oxygen was at around 30%. So I honestly don't know where what he's getting at here. I don't know how he arrived here. This is ridiculous. They treat all kinds of diseases with hyperbaric chambers. In India, they're treating leprosy, getting incredible results. Here's a kid being treated for cerebral palsy with hyperbaric oxygen. Doctors have discovered if they add more oxygen during surgery when the person's under anesthetic, only half as many patients get infections and only half as many people get nauseated just by giving the sleeping patient more oxygen. Interesting. There's a chamber in New York that treats autism. Are you kidding me? A chamber in New York that treats autism with oxygen? What? Creationevidence.org is his source on this one. Please, give me a break. Hudson Valley Hyperbarics in Southeast New York treats autism and neurological disorders and gets remarkable results. That is so many levels of obnoxious. I can't. I cannot even. <laughs> Autism with hyperbaric oxygen. Hyperbaric uh, therapies use as healing tool grows, article says. Here's a single person chamber. Did you know the Dallas Cowboys have a hyperbaric chamber? Why would professional sports teams want a hyperbaric chamber? Well, because they've discovered their injured players will heal twice as fast. See, if you pay the guy $1,000 a minute to go play with a ball, you want him out there playing with the ball. That's what she said. Okay, earning his $1,000 a minute or whatever they get. Here's a Zach, somebody from the Dolphins. It says, about three times a week during the season, Zach chills out for an hour or so in a hyperbaric chamber, a 12 by 4 bag inflated with pure oxygen that helps the body heal and promotes a feeling of well-being. Hmm. You can get your own hyperbaric sleeping bag if you want. Friend of mine. I, I don't know why you would want to. I get the point. Hyperbaric oxygen treatments have had benefits, have some benefits. Does not mean that all of your other claims are true. They're not. And in Oregon has a hyperbaric chamber. Here's my son running the camera back there and his wife and I at an oxygen bar in Alaska. Not a bar where you drink alcohol. I've never had alcohol in my life, okay? But you sit down to eat lunch and you breathe pure oxygen. You pay them five bucks and you breathe pure oxygen while you're eating lunch. And when you get done, you, man, you feel like going shopping again. Why? God, he's overselling the value of having a uh, high amount of oxygen. or bas Basically, he's overselling the value of taking in a high amount of oxygen. Um, yes, it, it has some health benefits. It has some benefits more generally. It does not make you a superhuman like he's about to tell us Adam and Eve were. You can't run 50 miles without ever getting tired running 30 miles an hour if you have an oxygen canister attached. It does not work that way. It's a conspiracy, I can tell you right now. The whole thing's a conspiracy to get you to spend more money, okay? But then you feel great. My friend in Oregon has a hyperbaric chamber. I was out there, he said, Brother Hovind, would you like to try it? I said, yeah. He put me in there, gave me a book to read, said, I'm gonna shut the door and pump it up to triple normal pressure. They, they use the diving terms. You're going to dive to 90 feet. Well, you're sitting right there in the chamber. You don't go anywhere, but it's like scuba diving to 90 feet. He said, now, <clears throat> I'll let you out in about an hour. I was in there breathing pure oxygen for an hour, reading my book, under triple normal pressure. When he let me out, he said, how do you feel? I said, I feel like running around the world. This is incredible. Now, how many of you old timers, uh, your get up and go done got up and went? You know what I'm talking about? You, yeah. <laughs> most exciting thing you can think of is taking a nap Sunday afternoon, right? Well, man, in the pre-flood world, if they had to double the air pressure and increased oxygen, you would just be full of energy. All uh, of course, he's, this whole thing is predicated on the idea that there is a gigantic canopy above Earth, a canopy of water or ice or something, and that canopy was increasing the air pressure. The, it's absolutely ridiculous from top to bottom. It's a full-blown conspiracy theory. There is no basis in fact here. 
Uh, so absolutely not true in any way, shape, or form. But he parrots these ideas anyways. It's ridiculous, dude, honestly. The time. There's a guy in Japan started raising tomato plants with pressurized carbon dioxide. You know, plants breathe CO2, not oxygen. His tomato plant grew faster than normal. When it was two years old, it was nine, uh, 14, 16 feet tall and produced 900 tomatoes. Again, uh, don't trust a single word that this guy says without actually verifying. Some of it is true. A lot of it is completely made up. Is there even a source? Sonic Bloom article in Creation Illustrated Summer. Oh, it's a creationist magazine. I'm not even going to bother looking it up. If what you're saying is true, you should be able to give me a secular source for it. I, I'm not even going to bother looking up any of your creationist magazines or whatever else. You need to be able to find a source that's independent and unbiased. Shopping center and built scaffolding to hold the branches up. They said, you know, this thing might produce 10,000 tomatoes. This is one tomato plant. It ended up growing 40 feet tall and producing 15,000 tomatoes off one plant. If this is true, you should be able to prove it with a scientific source or with a secular source. I don't want to see creationist sources from you. Also, if it's that simple to grow massive fruits, we don't even need GMOs, right? We can just increase the oxygen levels or whatever in greenhouses and boom. Wait, why would, wait a minute. Why would we create, why would we increase oxygen levels for plants? Is he talking about air pressure or oxygen? Maybe he's talking about air pressure. Um, if we increase the air pressure in greenhouses, you're saying that it would quadruple or quintuple or whatever the amount of food that it produces, right? This is a scientific marvel. Like this is, if this is true, this would absolutely revolutionize the farming industry. Why are you up there talking about Jesus when you could own a farm doing all of this and producing food 15 times faster than anybody else out there, than any other farm? This is a revolutionary type of discovery, if this is true. Of course it's not. Like I said, the only source he has is some creationist magazine that honestly, he probably wrote. He probably wrote the source in the first place. Plant, but there was tomatoes were coming off baseball size off of his. A guy in Iowa got curious, you know, why do the birds start chirping an hour before sunrise? He found out the chirping of the birds is a certain frequency that opens up the stomata on the leaf cells. You know, the leaf, if you look underneath with the magnet. Again, don't believe a word he says without hard evidence. Um, look, again, this source is from his creationist magazine, once again. We should have secular sources for this stuff. Fine glass has got these little holes in there that open up to let the CO2 come in. It wakes the leaf up in the morning. Well, he discovered that this frequency is found quite a bit in classical music. So he started playing Beethoven and Bach and Chopin to his cornfield. His neighbors thought, you know, un poquito loco a la cabeza, you know. He's about a half a bubble off a plum or something, you know. But cheese done fell out of his sandwich. Anyway. They thought he was nuts until his corn grew 15 feet tall. <clears throat> if this is true, why the hell are you giving sermons or whatever instead of farming? You should be farming. If this is real, get out there and start a farm and show everybody how to do it. This is absolutely ridiculous that he's even making these claims. He played it to his squash plants, and they grew, they grew five squash per leaf instead of one. He played it to his black walnut tree, and it grew twice as fast as normal. He, but Notice he's not referencing scientists doing these tests. He's referencing just some guy he knew, some friend he had. None of this is ever based on science. None of this is ever provable or any of that. It's always just somebody he knows did this stuff. You know, he's got t double or triple normal potato size. His cantaloupe were the size of soccer balls. He called it Sonic Bloom. There's a good magazine called Creation Illustrated. I've got one on the table down here. There are two Creation magazines, regular Creation magazine, that's a good one, and Creation Illustrated, which you can go to my website, just click on the dot to go to Creation Illustrated. They'll send you a free...
it's his it's his magazine, isn't it? Did he write this magazine? If he didn't, then they're a sponsor. Copy to try it. It's 20 bucks a year if you want to subscribe. But if you go to my website, Dr. Dino, you can click on that and get a free copy. It's, there's an article in there in one of the past issues about this uh, sonic bloom, which is really incredible. It's sitting on the table down here. Sign up for it on the drdino.com. I debated Jeannie Scott. She's the president of the National Center for Science Education in Berserk Lake, California. The National Center is a little bitty storefront building with five people in there. <clears throat> the National Center for Science Education. But I debated Jeannie Scott in a debate, and uh, she said, Dr. Hoven, there are 80 separate layers of coal in the Midwest. She's right. She said, if you look at the amount of coal in the world today, the entire biomass, all the plants of the world today, could not possibly be converted to that much fossil fuel. She's right again. There is so much coal in the world that if you took every tree and blade of grass and bush and squished it, you couldn't make all the coal. There are enormous volumes of coal in the earth. I said, Jeannie, you are right. Yeah, that, that actually, honestly, surprises the hell out of me. Oh my God, is there a lot of coal and oil and stuff in the ground? The fact that we still have like oil in the ground that we are even capable of pulling out absolutely blows my mind, dude. It, it really does. Holy shit, we have a lot of oil down there. Like the most surprising part about the whole thing is the fact that we have so much oil that we're even capable of destroying the environment. Like, how the hell did that happen? Jesus Christ. We are oily. She said, well, don't you see, Hoven? There had to be an enormous amount of time to lay down all the coal seams. Oh, no, no, no. Right there, she's wrong. You see, she's looking at today's world and assuming that's how it's always been. The coal we find in the ground today is a result of that flood which buried the world before the flood. Yeah, if you're going to make claims like this, which is exactly what Kent Hoven is doing, making wild, radical claims. If you're going to do that, you have to come with evidence. I'm sorry, man. When they had lots more trees. There's a coal mine in Montana that is 10,000 square miles of coal up to 200 feet thick. Someone told me a few months ago they've now found a seam 300 feet thick. That's a lot of coal. Okay, I suppose that's a lot of coal. I'm not sure what he's getting at. I assume he's about to drop a bomb on us about how, you know, all of this coal was created like in the past week or something. Complete nonsense, of course. A lot of coal. And sometimes in coal, <laughs> human artifacts are found. This bell was found inside a lump of coal. This hey, you know, why don't we look up this source? Mr. Newton Anderson found this bell inside a lump of coal in 1944 in West Virginia. Ugh, he still has the bell. Okay, let's look this up. Is there a source? Ammunition by Norm uh, Charbo, or Char Charbo? Communique? Conservative Publishers. I've never heard of this before. They give us their phone number and their email address. Well, so I guess Mr. Newton Anderson, just some guy, tells us, look, I found this bell inside of a lump of coal in West Virginia. You can email me or call me if you want, and I will tell you about it. Wow, dude. I would love it if people actually studied this and came up with real information that we could really research about this supposed bell in coal. But Kent Hovind never comes with scientific sources, never comes with evidence that's worth anything. It is always just hearsay and nonsense that's made up at best. Iron pot was found inside a lump of coal. The sole of a shoe found inside a lump of coal. We cover more on that on video. Well, let, let's look at this one. The, the pot inside of a lump of coal, the evidence here, or the, the source he cited is creationevidence.org. What a source. What's this one? This is a shoe sole from Nevada. And he claims that it was found inside of a lump of coal. The Hidden History of the Human Race, Michael A. Cremo, page 113 to 115. Has a phone number and everything. So ridiculous, dude. It is obnoxious that he insists on making these claims that he must know are fake, right? He must know. And he's the one that wrote the sources, isn't he? He knows there's no evidence for this stuff. He must. And he's spreading this nonsense anyways. 
was found inside a lump of coal. The sole of a shoe found inside a lump of coal. We cover more on that on video 6 about coal formation. But the Bible says there were herbs, that's plants, over all the earth. It's not that way today. 70% of the earth is underwater, for heaven's sake. Okay, that's not covered with plants. Well, at the time when the Bible was written, they didn't realize that there was more to earth than just what they knew and what they experienced. So it makes sense that they'd say it was covered over all the earth. Um, I mean, they didn't realize there was something past the oceans. They thought that there, you know, they thought that the continent that they lived on was the earth and the ocean was just the barrier that prevents them from going any further. The earth was covered with plants when God made it. Did you know they find leaves in Antarctica? 250 miles from the South Pole, they're finding leaves. There are no trees in the South Pole. 70% of the earth... Okay, so this one, I guess, this source says, scientists report finding fossils of dinosaurs in Antarctica's interior. Chronicle of Higher Education, March 20th, 1991, page A11. Why is he using a source that, once again, is 15 years old at this point? Why is he doing that? Today is underwater. Did you know only 3% of this earth is habitable for mankind? A lot of it's under desert, ice caps, tundra, mountain ranges that nobody can live on. 3% is habitable. What we're seeing today is not what Adam and Eve saw. The Bible says he formed it to be inhabited. That's why he did it. Probably the pre-flood world was, I would just be picking a number and say probably 80% land and only 20% water. The Don't you love how he just throws numbers out there and he says, I have no basis to believe this. This is just what I believe. Oceans weren't there. They, the water was in the crust of the earth or in the canopy overhead. But there, was, there were trees from pole to pole before the flood came. This layer of water above the earth would act as a barrier that would block out UV light and x-rays and other harmful things that come from the sun. See, the sun produces a lot of stuff besides light. It produces x-rays and gamma rays and beta rays and all them ray boys. Which, by the way, is light. X-ray, gamma ray, it's all different. It's all light on a different spectrum. Or it's on, I'm sorry. It's light on the same spectrum, it's just further up and further down on the spectrum than visible light. Come down here, and they're pretty hard on your carcass. X-rays particularly are dangerous. How many have ever had an X-ray before? I broke nine bones growing up. My brother broke 21. <laughs> we played rough in our neighborhood. One of my neighbors shot his brother through the leg with a crossbow. He said, I didn't know it was loaded. How can you not know a crossbow was loaded? Uh, anyway, you go to the hospital. Yeah, people give poor, piss poor excuses for that kind of thing sometimes. Fair enough. How can you not know a crossbow is loaded? Uh, duh. Anyway, you go to the hospital and they say, take off all your clothes and put this little gown on. You put this little gown on, you know, and they say, no, it doesn't, quite, it doesn't quite come together in the back. You know, it's kind of embarrassing. And then they say, now walk down the hall about 12 miles and you'll see the x-ray room. Well, if you make it all that way, they'll say, oh, we're so glad you made it. Would you please lay on this table? And they just got the table out of the freezer a few minutes before you got there. How many been on that same table? Now, you know what I'm talking about. It's ice cold. And he puts this weird machine on top of you, and the doctor says, okay, now take a deep breath. <sighs> yeah, I, th I think it was a little bit different than they do now. It doesn't really work this way as far as I can remember. I, I mean, I've only had x-rays at, like, the dentist, so I don't think I've had x-rays at... Uh, I don't think, anyways. Maybe I have, and it's just been, like, too long. Hold it. And he runs out in the hall. <laughs> right. <clears throat> He's about to talk about how harmful radiation is. We'll get to that in a second. And he puts this weird machine on top of you, and the doctor says, Okay, now take a deep breath. And hold it. And he runs out in the hall. And he's got a lead apron on. You say, Doc. You know why that is? That's because the doctor does this all day, every day. He does this like a hundred times a day, or the nurse or whatever. They do these things constantly. You getting checked one time to see if you have any broken bones, one time every two or three years or whatever, that's, that's very different from the doctor doing it day in and day out. Yes, it is a little dangerous, but guess what? It's worth it to find out if you have any broken bones. It's worth it, the one time per year you have to, or the one time every few years or whatever. Come here. Is this machine dangerous? <clears throat> he says, no, it's harmless. No, that's not true. No doctor 
worth anything would say an x-ray machine is harmless. But they would say it's very low risk for a single use per year or a single use every couple of years. I sit here and do this every single day. That's why I wear the lead shield. He's lying. You say, Doc, how does this machine work? He says, well, when I mash the button, x-ray bullets come out of that machine, and they're going to go right through your body like a machine gun, and we're going to blow you full of holes, billions of them, little tiny x-ray holes. We're going to actually make a shadow of what's inside your body, which, by the way, is why many radiologists have a negative outlook on life. <clears throat> but, okay, that's an old camera joke. We're going to blow you full of holes. But he knows it's dangerous for long-term exposure to x-rays. So that's why he's got the lead apron and runs out behind the lead wall. He don't want to get exposed to those x-rays. But a lot of people don't realize the sun x-rays us every day. We're being that's true. The sun does x-ray us every day. But it's very, very small amounts. Uh, it's not enough to harm us long-term uh, if we're careful and we stay out of the sunlight uh, as much as possible. But... It's not enough to actually, I mean, you can tell that the sun doesn't have a high concentration of x-rays because if it did, you would see your skeleton in your shadow. That's not the case. X-rayed right now. Now, concrete will stop x-rays and water will stop x-rays, but this roof on this church will not stop x-rays. They're coming right through the roof and right through your body. And you're being x-rayed as you sit there. Not a thing you can do about it. Well, I'll say it. Not much. Very, very little. In a minute, what you can do about it but your skin feels the full force of these x-rays. And your body has to fix the damage. I mean, you fix millions of holes in your skin every single day. Millions of them. That's true. Uh, you know, your skin is regenerating uh, on a regular basis because there are a lot of imperfections and holes and there's a lot of damage and stuff. I mean, that's what, you know, the regeneration process does. That's correct. And after 50 or 60 years, or 70 or 80 for sure, everybody around you starts to notice you are losing the battle for damage control. Your skin begins to wrinkle up. He used that picture in the previous one, too. You say, Brother Hovind, I, I, I don't want to get old and wrinkled. Okay. If you don't want to get wrinkled, there are three things you can do about it. Number one, you can die early. Number two, you can carry a lead or a concrete umbrella over your head at all times. Do not ever get exposed to the x-rays. Or number three, you can do what Elizabeth Taylor has done. How many have ever heard of Elizabeth Taylor, the movie star? Somebody. I know of Elizabeth Taylor, but I don't actually remember like who she is or what she played in or whatever. It's kind of a dated reference. She told me years ago she's got a hole in her forehead. Every morning she fills it in with caulk and covers it up with makeup, and it's really tough to see, but, you know, it's top secret, actually. But I was at Walmart one time, you know, checking out, trying to, you know, check out at Walmart. And there's all these magazines right there beside me. And one of them had Elizabeth Taylor's picture on the front. She was getting married for the 40th time or something, you know. What a heathen, right? Getting married for the 40th time. What a heathen. I thought, hey, I'm going to check this out. I heard about this hole in her forehead, but, you know, I wanted to see it for myself. So I got my Swiss Army knife out, which has a magnifying glass on it. And I picked up the magazine and I began staring at her forehead. People are walking down the aisle looking at me. I said, hey, what's the matter with you? I'm just looking at a magazine, huh? Go shop, right? I looked at it for a while, and I finally figured out what the hole was. I was so proud of myself. That lady has had so many facelifts down through the years trying to get rid of the wrinkles. It's her belly button right there. Oh, God, give me a break, dude. Uh, Kenneth Copeland, from my understanding, has had a lot of plastic surgery also, and that's why he looks the way he does. Uh, I don't know why anybody would choose to get plastic surgery, really. Just don't do it. It's a bad idea. Hey, go to Walmart. She's probably getting married again this week. You can see her picture on there. You say, well, Brother Hovind, I don't want to get old and wrinkled. Oh, I'm sorry. If you get old, you're going to get wrinkled, okay? You might as well get ready for it. But that didn't happen before the flood. The Bible says before the flood came, they lived to be over 900 years old and probably didn't wrinkle. One guy is going around, the, claims he's a creationist. He says, now, folks, uh, they didn't really live to be 900. They counted every month as a year. They used a lunar calendar, and you have to divide those numbers by 12. Wow. That's an even bigger miracle. Enoch was 65 when he begat Methuselah. 
Two of these guys are 65. Is he divided by 12? That makes him five and a half when he became a daddy. Honestly, I, don't try to take the Bible literally. Don't try to take it literally. It's a waste of everybody's time, including yours. Chan Man, if he is so afraid of x-rays penetrating his church's roof, then why doesn't he line the church with lead, <laughs> right? Uh, I think he believes that God will protect him. I doubt that real seriously. Okay. Don't take it literally, man. There's no point in taking all of this literally. I'd have a hard time believing that. No, they really were living to be 900, and they got bigger. Here's me by Robert Wadlow, tallest man in this century, 8 foot 11 and a quarter. Had a size 37 shoe. Pretty big. That is huge. Size 37, my God. That is very, very big. Yeah, there are some tall people out there for sure. Boy, okay. Robert Wadlow would have been just a few inches shorter than Goliath, who was about nine foot five or six. Robert yeah, I don't really fully believe the Goliath story. I don't know what historians have to say about it. I'm not sure if it's like accurate or if there's any evidence for it or any of that stuff. So I'm skeptical immediately of the story. Robert Wadlow at age 12 was the world's tallest Boy Scout. Here he is, age 12, with his Boy Scout troop. We would consider that gigantic at almost nine feet tall, wouldn't we? But I think uh, before... Yeah, people tend to have a lot of heart problems when they get that big. Um, they don't usually live to be very old because of all the heart problems. The flood, they got even bigger than that. Here's a... Oh, yeah. Um, somebody says, so... Wait. So Adam and Eve were giants? Oh, yeah. That's part of his theory. Quote, unquote, theory. I'm sorry. Part of his crackpot hypothesis. Yes. We're getting there. We're coming up on it in just a second. He's going to explain. Just wait. Skeleton of a man, 11 foot 6 inches tall. Well, long, not tall. He's laying down now. 11 6. How'd you like to have one of those guys on your basketball team? Well, UT would be the champs from now on, wouldn't they? 11 foot 6. Now, sometimes the women get upset with me and they say, Hoven, you said that was a skeleton of a man. Maybe it was a woman. Well, I taught biology and anatomy. Okay, I happen to know how to tell the difference. I really hope that he didn't teach biology and anatomy to anybody. I, I'm skeptical that he did. I don't, I, I don't know that he taught like any science classes, but my God, I hope he didn't. Well, I taught biology and anatomy. Okay, I happen to know how to tell the difference between a male and female skeleton. It is not the number of ribs. Only Adam was missing a rib and only for a short time because there's only one bone in the human body that'll grow back if you take it out. Your lower rib will grow back if you remove it. Oh, give me a break, dude. This is, this is Kent Hovind claiming that this is proof that Eve really was created from the rib and men and women have the same number of ribs, which by the way, that's true, they do. That was an old myth that was given to me by Jehovah's Witnesses. Uh, humans have, or Women have one fewer rib than men do, generally. Not true. It's nonsense. But what was that? Uh, will ribs grow back? Ribs regenerate to a near-normal radiological profile within six months of costectomy when gel foam scaffold is placed in the rib bed. Wow, this is actually a scientific article. It seems that the classification system allows an objective radiological assessment of the equality and quantity of rib regeneration. I guess some ribs do regenerate. He's using this as evidence that Adam and Eve were real. I'm sorry, you're going to have to come at me with a little bit more than this bone regenerates under some circumstances. You know, lizard's tail grows back if you cut it off. The lower rib will grow back if you take it out. Well, you'd almost think God... It depends from what I've seen. It depends. ...what he was doing if you didn't know better. But anyway, there are two ways to tell the difference between a male and female skeleton. One way is to look at the feet. If they're pointed toward the mall, it's a woman. Real nice, Kent. Real nice. Just keep on laying on that misogynistic BS. The other way is to look at the process on the temporal mandibular joint. If that joint right there is worn out more, <clears throat> it's a woman. More misogyny. <laughs> One lady said, that's because we have to tell you men everything twice. You don't listen first time. Oh, guilty, guilty. Tallest man today, it was eight foot four when this picture was taken. I've been told he's now eight foot seven, living in Ukraine. Pretty good sized boy. Hey, shout out to Ukraine. Eight foot seven. 
big hands. There he is trying to use a cell phone. <laughs> That'd be tough, wouldn't it? <laughs> that would definitely suck. I wouldn't want to be that tall. Roman Empire. Although something I've come to find is that a lot of people are like obsessive about tall people. They're like, they, they seem to think that tall people are just objectively better and they'll only date tall people. It's just kind of weird. Like, it's a weird thing to care about, it seems to me. That'd be tough, wouldn't it? <laughs> Roman Emperor Maximus was eight foot six 2,000 years ago. Where we get our word maximum from? A nine foot eight inch scale. I'm not really sure that's true. Again, it's kind of a, a little thing. Like, who really cares if he's telling the truth about this or not? The point is that you absolutely should not trust a single word out of the guy's mouth. Even basic claims like this. Do not trust a word. It was found in Indiana. Two skeletons, nine feet tall, found in Virginia City. Every skeleton found in this mine, in, uh, I mean, in this burial mound in Louisiana, 20 skeletons were found, all of them nine feet tall. Skeleton 10 feet tall, found in Humboldt Lake, Nevada. And in Guam, they have a legend that the giants used to live on the island of Guam and built these big latte stones over there. In Indiana, eight giants were found, ranging from eight to nine feet long, wearing heavy copper armor. Okay, he's building up to something. He's building up to something. Just wait until he comes out with his claim. With why, uh, just wait till you find out why he's trying to convince us that there are really tall people in the world. The museum was not interested in him. Why would a museum not be interested in nine foot skeletons to put on display? Again, uh, no reputable sources listed. What is Weird America by Jim Brandon, page 84. IOR.com. What the hell is IOR.com? I'm, I'm completely unfamiliar with any of these sources. I need something a little bit more solid than that. Uh, through the bungling of these diggers and the total disinterest of the archaeological museum establishment, these discoveries have now been scattered and lost. I'm skeptical of everything this dude is saying right now. Could it be that there's a theory called evolution which says we started off small and we're getting bigger? Uh, that's not what evolution says. What are you talking about? Makes us feel important, of course, you know. We're evolving. Ye shall be as gods. You're getting better. Could it be the truth is exactly the opposite? People were much bigger before the flood and now we're getting worse? And maybe they're trying to hide that? I just don't know how he manages to convince people of the conspiracy theories that he spreads. I do not know how people are still buying this stuff. A 12-foot skeleton found in Lompoc Rancho, California. Another 12-footer found in Tucson, Arizona. The guy had six toes. Six fingers, six toes, and a bird-shaped headdress. When the Mexicans, Cortez, went to uh, Mexico and conquered part of it. The people who lived there said, oh, there used to be giants that lived on this continent. They brought a bone of one of these guys out. Just the thigh bone was as tall as Cortez. Just the thigh bone. This one says, taken from discovery and conquest of Mexico and New Spain, Bernal Diaz de Castillo, page 185. I've never heard of that before. That's not a reputable journal. I know nothing about it. Let's just look this one up. Why not? Um, Discovery and Conquest of Mexico and New Spain. Bernal Diaz de Castillo, page 185. All right, let's look this one up. Uh, okay, it looks like it's an old book written by somebody. Uh, it's for sale at thriftbooks.com for $4.99. Um, Project Gutenberg... What was the role of Bernal Diaz de Castillo during the expedition of Herman Cortez? Or Hernan Cortez. I have no idea what, like, this isn't a scientific source at all. This is just a book. I, I'm not even honestly sure if it's a nonfiction book or not. It looks like it very well could be a fiction book. Like, I don't know, maybe not, but I just can't tell. I've never heard of it before. I don't know why we should be taking this as fact? Like, why are you even citing this? If this is true, there should be scientific articles talking about it, right? Why are we looking at, like, some random thrift store book that's on sale for $4.99 as our source? You know why we're looking at this book? Because he couldn't 
find any other source that supports his crackpot theories or hypotheses or claims, baseless claims. He needed some thrift store book to support his claims that humans were 20 feet tall at one point because of increased oxygen. Absolutely ridiculous. You'd think if that were the case, I mean, my, when I was little, my dad had an oxygen generator, had this like this big tall thing and he had the hose. You turn the generator on and you, you connect the hose to your nose and you just sit there, you know. When I was little, he had that. It, it seems to me that having this oxygen device that feeds oxygen directly into your nose seems like my dad should grow to like 20 30 feet tall if he's taking in pure oxygen right i mean that that seems logical to me if i'm going by kent hoven's logic i'm just saying just the thigh bone was as tall as cortez just the thigh bone and he said i'm a man of good size he said i'm a good sized guy and this was the same size as me this is a giant block of rock. Who on earth is moving these things? Consider that's a camel in front of it for scale. Who's cutting and moving these things? Not giant people. I can tell you that. It's not giant people. <laughs> oh my God, dude. I mean, it's a mystery how people in ancient Egypt managed to build the pyramids because they didn't have wheels back then. They had sleds. So how did they manage to move things like that? Good question. Really good question. How did that move, or how did they move that gigantic block? I love your line of thinking. The answer is not speculating that people were giants. That's not the answer. This is a 39-pound axe head. Swing a 10-pound sledge for a few minutes and see why. Wait. Ancient American... Wait, why did he list the source as Ancient American P.O. Box 370, Colfax, Wisconsin? I've never seen a source listed that way in my life with a phone number and everything. Ancient American, page four, is all it says, really. And then it has their address. What a bizarre way to list a source. Ancient American, page four. Yeah, I mean, Ancient American is a little broad. I would need like an issue number or something. I don't even understand. This is bizarre, dude. Gigantic axe head? Is that what he said? 30 pound axe head? This is a 39 pound axe head. I don't believe you. Simple as you can make the claims, I can refute them by just saying, I don't believe you because you're offering no evidence. That easy. Swing a 10 pound sledge for a few minutes and see why I'm wondering who's swinging a 39 pound axe head. This is a stone designed to be held between the thumb and finger for chipping. The Smithsonian is responsible for hiding most of the discoveries of giant humans. They don't want people to know about these giants because it goes against the evolution theory. Oh, isn't this interesting? This is a good example of a conspiracy mindset. This is a conspiracy mindset right here. If it doesn't match up with what I already believe, then it's because there's a conspiracy out there to cover it up. Everything, everything acts as evidence of the conspiracy. There's no evidence of the conspiracy. They're covering it up. There's actually evidence against it. That's because they're framing somebody or something else to make it look like there's another explanation. This is a classic conspiracy mindset. I'm sorry, Ken. If you want me to believe something, you're going to have to give me some hard evidence in favor of your belief, period. The skull used to be on display in Winnemucca, Nevada until a few years ago when they took it down. It's in the basement. You have to specially ask to see it. A giant human skull. Here's a normal human thumb bone. Underneath is a giant human thumb bone. This is part of a skeleton. Photo by Ron Wyatt. Who is Ron Wyatt? And why would I trust or believe anything that he had to say? I don't believe. I, I simply don't believe you. I mean, if you haven't seen the previous parts of this, you may not know this. But Kent Hovind has lost all credibility, all credibility. That's why I'm sitting here checking every single source that he releases, because he has proven to me that he just flat out lies about things. Earlier in one of the other parts, he claimed that the oldest tree is a bristlecone pine at 4,300 years old or 4,200 years or something, and then claimed that 
Noah's flood happened about 4,200 years ago. And the fact that the bristlecone pine is 4,200 years old proves that that's when the flood happened. Except the bristlecone pine isn't 4,200 years old. It's 5,000 years old. It's 800 years older than you need it to be for it to support your flood crackpot conspiracy theory. So I'm going through and checking every single source, every one of them, because he is proven without a shadow of a doubt there's absolutely nothing that he could say that I could trust. I Literally nothing is trustworthy out of his mouth. So you're going to have to give me a little bit more than Ron Wyatt took this picture. Found at a grave in Turkey right near Mount Ararat. The government of Turkey says they have found the grave of Noah. The skeleton was 12 feet tall. Now that would make... Yeah, I bet. Uh, I haven't heard anything about that from the Turkish government. Uh, when did this happen? I mean, I know that Christians from America claimed that there was... Uh, claimed that they found Noah's Ark in Turkey and on near Mount Ararat or something like that. Turns out it wasn't actually Noah's Ark. It was just like a, a mountain formation or whatever. But I, I didn't hear anything about the Turkish government, who is not Christian, by the way, claiming that Noah's uh, claiming that they found Noah's body. What? Let me look this up, actually, out of curiosity. Turkish government Noah's body. Now, I'm seeing references to Noah's Ark being found in Turkey, not by Turkish government officials, but in Turkey. Uh, not seeing anything about the Turkish government admitting they found Noah's body and it was 12 feet tall. That's just complete and total nonsense from the ground up. Is Cuba a little bigger, wouldn't it? Oh, yeah. Let me just step back because this is an important part. Thumb bone. This is part of a skeleton found at a grave in Turkey right near Mount Ararat. The government of Turkey says they have found. Yeah, Mount Ararat, as I said, Mount Ararat is like uh, where they claim that Noah's Ark was. Um, it was just a mountain formation. They did not find Noah's Ark there. It's complete nonsense, but. Christians like Kent Hovind continue to repeat this, so. This is part of a skeleton found at a grave in Turkey right near Mount Ararat. The government of Turkey says they have found the grave of Noah. This not true. They did not make that claim. Skeleton was 12 feet tall. Now that would make his cubit a little bigger, wouldn't it? Yeah, so cubit is from the, like, the elbow to the, you know, the, the fingertips, I believe. And the reason it's important that a cubit is really, really long is because Noah's Ark w was measured in cubits, supposedly. So they need the cubit to be really, really long, right? Because that's the only way that they could possibly fit two of the unclean animals and seven of the clean animals on the boat. Every single animal in existence. Penguins from the poles. Uh, which one is it? The so are penguins at the South Pole or the North Pole? I don't remember. Penguins at the South Pole. Polar bears at the North Pole. Kangaroos in Australia. Uh, I mean, everything. Every type of marsupial, mammal, everything, man. Even ants, ant colonies. You need everything. You need all of it. So how do you fit all of that? Seven of, the seven of the clean, two of the unclean. How do you fit it all in a tiny little boat? And his explanation? Well, Noah was 12 feet tall, so his cubit was a little bigger than ours, and so the boat was technically a little bigger than we thought it was. Awesome. Awesome explanation, Kent. You still haven't explained how he made a gigantic boat without saws. How did he make a boat out of wood with no saws or nails? We aren't even, we're talking Stone Age, man. We didn't even have, we're not Bronze Age, we're not Iron Age. We're talking Stone Age still. 
and he made a gigantic boat bigger than you know what i'm not even going to get on this tangent it's been disproven a billion times already let's keep listening he used his teeth like a beaver that makes sense god made it so god made his teeth into saws right is that how it happened people say one man and three boys could never build a boat that size huh you didn't see those boys hey bubba bring me that tree would you <laughs> sure God, he really does believe this stuff, dude. I love how they depict one of the people who is supposed to ride on the ark as bigger than the ark itself. Isn't that funny? How's this kid going to fit in the ark? Dad, where do you want it? We've got a replica of a thigh bone in our museum from a guy that would have been about 13 feet tall. You meet a guy like that, call him Sir. There's an article on the table all about it down here. If you want to read more on this one. Thigh bone replica from a giant skeleton found in Egypt. Wow. Joe Taylor makes castings, and they give us Joe Taylor's phone number. How much you want to bet that isn't even a real phone number? I would be willing to bet it's not even real. What is this? 806-675-7777 or 2421? Should we call it? Should we call this phone number? And just see? Or no, should we just leave it? Maybe we should just leave it alone. How is it that you block your number? I think it's star 69, right? So it's star 69. I, I'm not hooked into anything, so I can't, like, you guys wouldn't be able to hear it. 806 675 Hey, my name is Owen Morgan. I saw you listed in a Kent Hovind video. I was wondering if I could ask a couple of questions about what you do. Uh, but yeah, just uh, send me an email at uh, telltaleatheist at gmail.com. I would appreciate it. Maybe I should call him back later. Uh, Hopefully they'll send me an email, or maybe I should just call him and give him my phone number. That could be interesting. What did he say it was? Or can somebody tell me the name of it? What was the name of that place? Something museum and something or other? Miss the name? Bet they won't write back because you gave your atheist email. Yeah, maybe. Maybe I should just give him a call back later on, after I get off air. Thought it said publishing company? That could be. It was something something publishing company. Okay, well, I'll give them a call back later on and see if I can get some information from them. You know, Kent Hoven put the phone number right here in the thing. They must have expected people to call back. It's a sculpture. Yeah, it is. It's a sculpture. Um, it's, it's a quote-unquote replica. Fossil Museum and Publishing Company. Okay, I'll give them a call back and see if I can get information from them later on. Anyways, uh, I'm going to need a little bit more than a replica, a sculpture. I'm going to need more than just a sculpture. Oh, wait, there's a clip of it. Very good. Very nice. Good job. Uh, thank you, Lord Falconis. Let me see if I can listen to it. Mount Blanco. Mount Blanco Museum and Publishing Company. Uh, interesting. Where is this place? Mount Blanco. I mean, if it's, if it's not a Christian organization, if it's not a Christian, like, company or whatever, they will call me back or email me or whatever, and they won't care if it's an atheist email address. If it's a legitimate place that has a legitimate thing, they will give me, or they will send me an email. I'm sure of it. So they are art replicas. I think so, yeah. They're art replicas. That's the impression that I'm getting. Anyway. Okay, well, now that we've figured that out, uh, this isn't a very good source, Kent. This replica, quote-unquote, this replica bone. But I'm going to find out if this is 
an actual replica of an actual bone. I will find this out. And if it's a human bone, because that's the claim, right? He's claiming that it's a giant skeleton of a human, or, or at the very least implying it. We'll find out. Well, on the table, all about it down here. If you want to read more on this one. These jaw bones are on display at a hotel in Turkey, six and a half inches across the TMJs. This is implying that these are all human bones. There's no evidence that they're real, first of all. And second, there's no evidence that they're human, even if they are. And third, WyattMuseum.com, photo by Ron Wyatt. Who is Ron Wyatt? Why are you giving me another phone number? Its motto is digging up the facts of God's creation one fossil at a time. Is it really? They are replicas of descriptions from an anonymous letter. There you go. I hope he emails me. I would love to talk to him. Ron Wyatt is another Bibleist like Kent. Why are you giving me random people's names, Kent, who are Bibleists like you? Seriously, how is this useful to me? I need verifiable evidence. This is useless to me, man. If you could put your head inside the jaw and bounce it around. Waukesha, Wisconsin. They found a human skull three times the size of ordinary humans. The Index, Waukesha, Wisconsin, Friday, October 14th, 1904, volume 11, number 9. Mounds are a few feet underwater now in the lake in front of Ali's Resort. Wow. That's crazy. So... His supposed source is from October 14th, 1904. We haven't found any other examples of this anywhere. This is the only one. And that's just assuming the source is real. I feel I've proven without a shadow of a doubt that Kent likes to make sources up. An Indian burial mound. Giants were on the earth in those days. As the Bible says, there were giants here. Well, the Bible says we're made in God's image. Now, if we're made in God's image, why do we pay to teach the kids that this is Grandpa? What is the truth about the cavemen? Where do cavemen fit into this picture anyway? I mean, if the Bible's true and the Earth's only 6,000 years old, what about the cavemen? Well, we'll cover that. Hey, solid question. What about the cavemen? Uh, it doesn't seem like there's a good answer for this one. After a quick break. Cavemen, coming next. Oh, to be. Uh, once again, they're splitting it into two parts. I love it. This is a VHS tape. This is so old school, dude. I remember watching old VHS tapes. You could put anything on these motherfuckers. The VHS was a, a, is a lost era. I truly miss VHS. I assume this was VHS that, we, that he put this on. I mean, it's 4-3 aspect ratio, so. but it was 2005, so I don't know. Anyway, I do miss VHS. Caveman, coming next. 